They're strong, dependable, and have a fetching personality. They're Labrador Retrievers. We'll find out what makes these dogs lovable friends and fearless leaders. Next on Breed All About It. Cyrus is your typical Labrador Retriever. Retrieving is what he does best. It's just that sometimes he gets a little carried away. Hello. Oh, good morning, Ruth. Cyrus is heading down the driveway, yeah. Oh, it does appear that he has more newspapers than we normally get. Cyrus, did you get another paper this morning? He gets into trouble. He knows he can get away with it because he knows that I just, I love him down to the court. Cyrus has always been just a very loving dog. He's great with kids. Kids love him. He's got a great personality. He's, um, you know, I trained him to get the newspaper. I could train him. I mean, he'd almost, he'd bring me my coffee in bed if he could. And he comes from the school of how can I help you? Whether it's the morning paper or tennis balls for the neighborhood gang, Cyrus is always doing something for others. He's a special dog with unusual talents. Cyrus became a retriever of rocks, almost as a joke. But one day I thought, I'll throw a rock in the water. Rocks sink. And Cyrus jumped in the water, and I'm not sure whether he was feeling around for it with his paws or what, but all of a sudden he dove down into the water. And I've never seen a dog's head go under the water like that. And he went down and he got the rock that I threw in the water, and he got it. I'm not sure whether he smells it. I'm not exactly sure how he finds it, but he, he will nine out of 10 times bring back the rock that I throw in the water. Never had a dog that I loved as much as Cyrus. He's the king. Their appeal on the home front is matched by their ability in the field. Labs have a reputation as an all-purpose, all-weather sporting dog. Elvis is a three-year-old master hunting retriever. I think that the Labrador is number one uh, because they're a dual-purpose type of dog. They're great household companions and pets, but when you pick up a gun and hunt, they're ready to go. Labs do one thing better than almost any other dog. They'll retrieve anything, anywhere, anytime. Elvis isn't just running into the water and fetching the buoy. Several buoys are launched into the water in different places at slightly staggered intervals. Part of Elvis's skill is watching the order the targets go in, where they go, and retrieving them in order. Elvis practices like this often to keep sharp for the American Kennel Club and field trial competition. We feel that it's very important to simulate all those things that the dog is going to see in the field. So uh, the use of a gun, shots, being familiar with decoys, uh, dogs going in and out of boats, everything we'd actually encounter in a hunting situation. To give Elvis a serious challenge, Decoy geese on land and in the water mingle with real geese. The real geese don't realize this time they're the decoys. One of Elvis's toughest training exercises is the blind retrieve. Now he doesn't wear a blindfold, 
but he's not allowed to peek when the decoys are launched. He has to rely on Jack's hand signals to point him to the target. We like the Labrador Retriever because they're so biddable. For the average uh, handler or owner, uh, they seem to be the easiest to train. It's easy enough for a dog to retrieve something he saw or even something his handler directs him to. However, in real life hunting situations, dogs don't always have visual cues. That's when the lab's sense of smell kicks into high gear. Okay. Dr. Larry Myers of Auburn University's School of Veterinary Medicine has been studying the mysteries of the canine olfactory system for years. We don't really know how much better a dog's sense of smell is than a human's. We know it's a lot. When a dog sniffs air, we have a straight shot, virtually, to this rather yellowish tissue right here, which contains the receptor cells for the sense of smell. Now, this becomes electrically activated by uh, the odor, and this information is transmitted through the olfactory nerve, through this little bony plate, to this structure which is the olfactory bulb. The olfactory bulb is uh, within the central nervous system and responsible for quite a lot of analysis of olfactory information. Much of this portion of the brain of the dog is in fact devoted to the sense of smell. Dogs usually have 20 to 30 times the number of receptor cells that we have. Comparatively, the human's olfactory bulb is extremely small the dog is really designed to smell. Our subject, Clint, is letting Dr. Myers test just how superior his sense of smell is. He's blindfolded to reduce outside stimulus. Since Clint can't talk, he also has electrodes attached to measure the activity in the olfactory centers in his brain. Highly diluted samples of scent are kept in sealed glass vials in a smell-proof box. When Clint is calm and undistracted, Dr. Meyer's assistant opens the vial and tries to gauge the subject's response. Any curiosity or interest in the vial means he's detected a smell, even though it may be extremely diluted, to one part per million, well beyond human detection. What we can't tell is how much he likes what he's smelling. The Labrador's natural ability has been aided by careful breeding, but its popularity has some breeders deeply concerned. The curse of any breed is being number one on the AKC list. It means that anybody who has a Labrador can put two Labradors together and have a raise a litter of puppies and probably sell them. Unfortunately, sometimes those people are very well intentioned but very poorly informed. We know that in the Labrador there are some really big health problems that are a very big concern. One is bone and joint problems, primarily hip dysplasia, and other bone-related problems that can be lumped together as elbow dysplasia and different forms of osteochondritis. If you are considering purchasing a Labrador, you should definitely get one from breeding stock that is certified free of hip dysplasia. Skeletal difficulties aren't the only problems labs face. The other big problem that occurs in Labradors are eye problems, progressive retinal atrophy and central retinal atrophy. <laughs> One of the best ways to find a healthy lab is to find a reputable breeder. You'll find them at confirmation shows. This is the Bare Bones Specialty Show in Leesburg, Virginia. Ann Evans is here competing with her dog, Ransom's Duckback Indigo. Confirmation is very important because we want to continue to make sure that the Labrador does represent the original intent of the lab. And what was that original purpose? 150 years ago, these dogs were dragging fishermen's nets in from the sea along the coast of Newfoundland, nabbing stray fish who thought they could get away. Later, they were imported to England and became hunting dogs. Still later, these sturdy dogs did police work and sniffed out landmines in the First World War. 
Labs come in three colors, yellow, black, and chocolate. Whatever the color, they are all built to practically live in the water. The thick tail is often compared to an otter's. In the water, it works like a rudder. The double coat consists of a downy inner layer, which keeps him warm, while the coarser, oily outer layer repels water. He's wash and wear. And the webbing between his toes gives his doggy paddle an extra push. Full speed ahead. They also develop what's called a soft mouth, a configuration of teeth and lips, which allows them to carry game without damaging it. However, the characteristic that breeders take the most pride in developing is temperament. Our role as responsible breeders, as responsible lab owners, is to make sure that we are sticking to that temperament, that great temperament. Thank you so much. <laughs> Anne is proud of her dog Indigo for winning her class. But she's even prouder of her dogs who've been selected to be guide dogs for the blind. Headquartered in Yorktown Heights, New York, Guiding Eyes for the Blind is one of the country's oldest service dog organizations. Every year, Guiding Eyes provides guide dogs for over 160 blind people, changing their lives forever. And more than 98% of the dogs that graduate from this special school are Labradors. If we had to sum up what makes the Labrador Retriever superior, if we will, uh, to other breeds of dogs, I think it'd have to be said in two words, self-confidence and adaptability. The Labrador is paragons of these two particular virtues. Amos is an 18-month-old lab who's been in training for three months. The fundamental things that we teach moving forward taking left and right turns, moving around obstacles, looking out for traffic but not becoming so sensitive to it that they're afraid to go into the street. All of these puts great stress on some dogs. The truly exceptional guide dog is the one that responds to all of these individual things and comes up with initiative. Amos has already passed a battery of tests and is now in the final stage of training. While it may look like he's just walking down the street, the skills he's already mastered are tremendously complex and pretty unnatural for a dog. The first thing that a guide dog has to learn how to do is to move forward in a straight line at a consistent pace. It may be so simple that it's absurd to point it out, but in order for a dog to learn to stop at the end of the block, he has to learn to go to get to it. Even the simplest tasks have hidden pitfalls. If we see Amos go up a curb, his instructor stumbles over the curb as though he had no sight at all. And this teaches Amos very quickly what will happen if he makes that mistake in the future. As we see Amos recovering from these mistakes, his head's up, his tail's wagging. He knows what he should have done there. He is not fearful, he's just, but he absolutely knows what he's supposed to do. Turning left requires even more training. Turning left with a person and dog in step is very difficult for the dog to learn. Dogs don't frequently walk backwards, and a dog that's making a left turn has to start that turn by walking backwards. He's also then moving away from the direction that he intends to travel. And so we're asking this dog to do two things in a row that are contradictory to what he knows is the final outcome. While Amos seems to have the right stuff to be a guide dog, only half the puppies that enter the training program actually graduate. Finding dogs with the perfect temperament for guiding is so difficult, the school began its own breeding program to ensure a steady supply of recruits. Jane Russenberger has directed the school breeding program since 1988. 
Our goal is to produce a certain number of dogs for the blind people that are waiting for the future. And if we don't have our own dogs, uh, then we never know for sure if we're going to have the right dogs. By having our own breeding colony, we can be assured of the, uh, the fact that they have the right temperament and the right health to meet our needs. If negative things happen to the Labrador breed, we've got our own gene pool. As vital as good breeding is to making great guide dogs, Guiding Eyes goes to great lengths and great expense to guarantee there will always be a fresh supply of these pups. Not only do they selectively breed their best dogs today, they also cryogenically store the sperm of their most outstanding sires for future use. Having a cryogenic center is something very special for a guide dog school, but it helps us to preserve our dogs for the future so we have the, the very, very best dogs to choose from. Still, Jane knows that Guiding Eyes is not the only school training dogs to assist blind people, so they make sure others can benefit from their accumulated wealth of specimens. We use a lot of the semen for ourselves, but we also share our semen with other schools throughout the world. It's a cooperative breeding effort to help schools that don't have uh, the quality of dogs that we do or may have something that they can share with us as well. However, even the most meticulous breeding efforts can't guarantee complete success. This is Indy, a prospective guide dog. At seven weeks old, all recruits are given the first of a series of evaluations that will continue straight to graduation. So far, he's impressing Jane. He definitely has one characteristic she likes to see in a guide dog. Indy is independent. Independence and confidence are vital. For contrast, here's his brother Innes. You can tell he lacks the confidence you see of Indy. This is an unknown environment for him, and rather than explore the center of the room, he sticks to the perimeter and clings to the security of Jane. For this part of the test, puppies are restrained to see how well they handle not being in control. A guide dog puppy should accept the restraint and not be too upset or worried about it. Sometimes they struggle to get back up out of fright. And you can see Indy's uh, just basically, okay, that's cool. Now it's Innes' turn. Uh, so far his head hasn't dropped back to the ground yet. And his feet are a little more stiff than his brother. And if you look at the expression in his eyes, he's not as relaxed looking. He's just not as good as his brother. Now we're looking at the elevation. It's like the restraint. He doesn't have any control over the situation. And is he nervous or is he relaxed? But he's OK. He looks pretty good there. He's looking around. He's quite relaxed for this. Now, this is one of the hardest tests of all. This is the noise test. It's a, a metal can with some rocks in it. And he did a wonderful thing. He didn't get worried at all about it. His tail was up and wagging, and he came right over to see it. Uh, what we do is to test him twice on the same noise. But you can see he's just as cool the second time. And he shows a little bit of concern there. He actually crouched down just a little bit and left. And now we want to coax him over, see if he'll come. And he thinks I'm the safe one around here. The umbrella is actually another test. They want to see his reaction to this somewhat threatening foreign object. We're assessing his self-confidence. And he says, that's just great. He's not nearly as relaxed as his brother. Now, this is our little uh, toy that can sometimes frighten dogs because it's got eyes, it moves. Indy appears to be on the road to becoming a guide dog. As for Innes, he'll be given another chance at testing. But even if he doesn't make the cut, he'll still end up in a loving home. The waiting list for people wanting to take home one of these dogs is over 700 names long. I first became blind, it was dark, it was cold. It was something I was totally not used to. 
1993, Alan Golubek lost his vision in a motorcycle accident. He learned how to use a cane, but always longed for the active lifestyle he had before the accident. The school called Alan and offered him a dog named Kessler. I got Kessler, and it seemed to get brighter and brighter and brighter as days went on. Now Kessler is Alan's constant companion, waiting patiently while Alan works on one of his newfound passions, building wooden canoes. You know, after I build these boats, I take them out and I burn them in the water and I get my guide dog and the two of us, we paddle around the water and it's a great sense of freedom. It's a lot of fun. Alan lives outside of New York City. He and Kessler often board the train to go there in order to visit friends. If anything will put Kessler's training to the test, it'll be safely guiding Alan through the streets of Manhattan. He relies on Kessler to help him navigate the urban jungle, a tough job for a sighted person, much less a dog. You've known dogs all your life is to fetch and to play and to be obnoxious and just to be a dog. And you know, here you are putting your life in your hands with a dog, crossing streets and going upstairs and getting on subways, but now, Having Kessler for almost three years, I wouldn't do it any other way. I walk faster, I walk safer. Uh, I know I'm in good hands with him. Manhattan is very busy, very populated. It can be stressful, that dog works, he works hard. His head is constantly going back and forth looking for obstacles and he makes sure that you are safe. That's his job. It's definitely doable, it's done all the time. I mean, I go into the city and visit my friends and it's great. There isn't anything that he can't do. You know, I, I got my freedom back. Good boy. All right, forward. Come on. Let's go. Guide dogs like Good Kessler boy. can work until they're between Good eight boy. and 10 years old. By then, older dogs have a harder time keeping up with the rigorous daily requirements of guiding a blind person. Good boy. Good boy. But the list of families waiting to adopt the school's retired guide dogs is almost as long as the one to adopt puppies. I'm going to keep him as long as I can, and uh, you know, I, my family's got dibs on him already when he has to retire. My father, who lives down in North Carolina, when he's seen how happy I was, you know, he's now a puppy raiser. He's on a second dog, which I think is great. Although a guide dog costs as much as $20,000 to breed, raise, train, and place with a blind person, no blind person is required to pay for the dog that they receive, completely supported by voluntary donations from the general public. Everybody that's involved is doing it to help somebody, and it's, it's a real gift of love. What else could you do in life that could give you that kind of a thrill? With their sunny dispositions and generous hearts, labs like Cyrus and Kessler bring a ray of light into the lives they touch. They're all around athletes, versatile workers, and loving companions. Their combination of talent, tenacity, and disposition is unmatched in the dog world. From duck country, to downtown. Labs have made themselves indispensable. And in the process, heroes in our hearts.